it's there. Other things about Val, she runs the fauna project down at the Wildflower Center where she documents the animal life and comes up with, you know, new species every now and then. And it's, and it's not just insects and spiders, it's other things too, including mammals. She um, teaches entomology courses like the one she teaches for Travis Audubon, the butterfly ID class. And she is one of the mainstays of the Austin Butterfly Forum where she's often the speaker. And she, Val also has authored some pocket guides, Butterflies of Central Texas, Unusual Insects of Texas and Spiders of Texas. You can look for those at your local grocery store. She's also done ones for Florida, which is where her mom is based. Um, her own website, if you want to look at it, is called Austin Bug Collection. So if you just put in Google search Austin Bug Collection and put Valerie Bue, you should be able to find her. So I have known Val for a while and I've taken her insect course that she offers through Lifetime Learning Institute here in Austin. And she, I've taken her butterfly ID class and she speaks. I try to make every talk that she speaks for different organizations. She has amazing insights into an insect behavior. And by the end of her talk, I predict you will be as fascinated with these tiny creatures as you are with birds. So please welcome Val Bu. Applause. Imagine. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. Yeah, I love imagining the applause. <laughs> okay, so our talk today is, of course, pollination. And I'm going to cover several aspects of it, including kind of what it is, why it's important, the major players, and uh, eventually I'll also talk about the challenges and things that are working against pollinators, basically. So for as a basic explanation, it's very simple. Pollination is simply moving the pollen, which is the male um, gametes, to from the male flower to a female flower, or the parts of such. So this is jimson weed, which has a nice big flower that you can actually see the fuzzy little anthers with their pollen on it. And you can see the stigma, which is the sticky part where it gets it. And we all know that in the plants can often reproduce vegetatively where they just clone themselves. And that works fine for a while, but not in long-term survival. Um, there's a reason that sexual reproduction dominates all aspects of life on this planet. And actually talking about sexual reproduction with plants is a pretty safe thing to do. It's nothing like watching the neighborhood dogs. Okay, so back in the 19th century, mid 19th century, a popular concept came about that was uh, pollination syndromes. And these were suites of characters that certain flowers just um, exhibit that let you know what pollinates them. And it works to some extent, especially for broad categories. And it helps us kind of get a grasp on the different kinds of pollination. Eventually, this idea was taken to very small things like what is bee pollinated or other things, and it kind of breaks down at that point. It's, it's not as easy to categorize flowers by how they're pollinated as it seems. However, there are a couple of easy ones like hygrophily, which is pollination by water, and that's very uncommon. Um, it's not a particularly it's not a really useful way to pollinate because these plants have to be in the water first. But one common plant we have that does use this is eelgrass, which isn't a grass, it's a regular flowering plant. And what you're seeing on here, this is the female flower. It's actually got little fuzzy things on the ends that if there's any movement at all on the water, it tends to draw floating stuff in towards it. So the pollen will actually be drawn into the the plant. Much more common though is anemophily, which is wind pollination. And if anybody suffers from ragweed allergies, <laughs> you know what wind pollination does. It, a plant produces copious amounts of pollen. It gets airborne. It's lightweight. It travels through the air, finds the right plant. Our conifers are also pollinated this way. Um, just think cedar fever. And that season is coming up, so <laughs> prepare. Um, wind pollination is actually probably the most important method of pollination that we have. 
because it also includes some trees. You know, there's the little thought experiment. They say, what would we do if all insects were suddenly gone? Well, a lot of things wouldn't get pollinated. We wouldn't have apples or some other favorite fruits and stuff. Um, but we would still have pecans because pecans are pollinated by the wind. And as you can see, the flowers on these trees don't look particularly beautiful. They don't have the attractive parts, the petals, the things that would attract a pollinator because the wind simply acts. All they have to do is produce pollen and, and catch it. The big group of plants that uses wind pollination are the grasses. And so you can imagine all the grasslands, especially in North America, it's you kind of think of the pollen above them as being the ocean spray over those amber waves of grain. <laughs> And so all grasses are wind pollinated. They produce a flower that's down to just the basics. It's simply the reproductive parts. There are no petals or anything showy. Um, doesn't mean they're not pretty when you look at them up close. And our most important grasses, of course, are the grains that we use to feed the over seven and a half billion people on this planet. So this is where to us as a species, wind pollination is quite important because this is how we get our, our major food sources. But it gets much more interesting when we start involving animals. And zoophily is pollination by vertebrates. And there are some plants that are very specific to this, um, not very many. So the one here, I'm showing a hummingbird, but that flower, it's pollinating is not specific to birds. It just happens to fit really well. And you can see that the hummingbird puts its beak right into the flower to get the nectar. The anthers and the stigma are right above its head and touching the forehead. So that's where it's doing the service to the flower for a reward. On the other hand, a saguaro cactus with a flower that's 20 feet up in the air, it's big, it's white, and it's fragrant. And so if any of you know the natural history of saguaros, you know that this is bat pollinated. And that's about the only thing that would fly up that high. And they do it at night. And since mammals sense of smell is so good, the fragrance of the flower is certainly a good lure. By far the most common relationship though is entomophily and that's pollination by insects. Partly insects are the right size. Um, if Suppose a lot of other mammals did pollination or a lot of other, a lot of birds. They would be bigger and flowers would have to be a little bigger to handle them. But insects are just the right size. And this is the way the relationship works. The insects get what they want and the plant gets what it wants. <laughs> so the, one of the most in, in incredible kinds of flowers and the smallest flowering plant are duckweed. Most people have never even seen a duckweed flower. So there you go. That's what they look like. They're little white dots. That little water meal that's in between the duckweed is also a flowering plant, but I don't have an electron microscope and I think I would need something like that to actually see the flowers. Um, these little flowers are kind of complex in their pollination. They produce a drop of nectar. Uh, there are not many insects that spend time on the water, but there are somewhat insect-like arthropods, um, especially springtails. They're little tiny hexapods that they have six legs, but they're not really insects. But they're tiny. They're lured to the, the pollen in the flower or the nectar on the flower. They disturb the pollen, which breaks loose and quite quickly dries out and then becomes airborne. So duckweed, being one of our tiniest flowering plants, has one of the more complex methods of pollination. So the main insect groups though that pollinate are there are five large insect orders and these all of these play some part in pollination to and the extent to which they do that varies quite a bit. So I'll go through the major orders and we'll talk about each one kind of using examples from around here in central Texas. So hemiptera are the true bugs. They have sucking mouth parts, so they feed through a tube. The Lepidoptera are the butterflies and moths. They also have a proboscis and they feed through a tube also. Diptera are the true flies. The Coleoptera are beetles. 
and the hymenoptera include the bees and wasps. And so why are insects such great pollinators? They fly. That makes them highly mobile. They can get from one place to another quickly. And of course, they're small size. Insects were the first animals to evolve flight. Before that, every animal on land was earthbound. And flowering plants did not evolve really until they, the relationship with insects changed from insects that eat plants to insects that can be lured to plants to carry their um, spores and their, um, and their pollen to another flower. There are, sometimes people think a lot of flowers have very specific insects that work with them, but this is actually kind of the rarity. Um, here are two examples of their, their very exclusive relationships where only one kind of insect can pollinate these flowers. Figs are well known as having a wasp pollinator. It's a very tiny wasp. A fig is, the fruit is actually kind of an inside out flower that never quite opens. The one I'm showing here happened to be on a fig tree with hundreds of figs and one of them split open like it's a retrograde version of the flower almost open so you can kind of see all the pollinating bits in there um, so that's one exclusive relationship the other one is the yucca um, yuccas around our area in austin i've never seen a yucca seed pod on them i have to go out of town to outlying areas to find them um, the yucca moth is the only insect capable of pollinating these plants, and it actually, when it develops, the caterpillars live in the seed pod, destroying some of the seeds, but not all of them. So somehow, Austin has lost its yucca moth population, and nobody I know has ever really seen the yuccas go to seed. My guess is it might be related to deer browsing that could have wiped out enough of the population that the insects just aren't around. They're not extinct because they're certainly in other areas, but just not here in town. But many flowers are, they're just the epitome of um, redundancy. <laughs> Anything can, can pollinate them as long as it walks around on them, gets pollen on it, moves around. In this little thing, this is one kind of flower, fleabane, and it's a composite. It, as you can see, there are members of all five of the big orders here. So at any time, you might see one or other of these insects on the flower. Some of them are good pollinators and some are not. Some of them will carry more pollen and will visit more flowers. And so both of those things, of course, increase the chance of the flowers setting, spreading their sexual, um, their um, gametes all over the place. And on the other hand, we can have one very promiscuous insect. Toxomeris marginatus is a little syrphid fly, and it's quite tiny. It's about four to five millimeters long. It's active in Austin all year long. So anytime it's warm enough, you know, if the temperature gets up and the sun is out, it can be about 40 degrees and these flies are still, they're moving around. Um, and so they're active throughout the whole year. If a one kind of insect would to visit all these flowers at the same time, it certainly wouldn't help the plants because they take the pollen from one plant to the wrong plant and it would be wasted. But instead, these are working over a period of the whole year. So generally, that's why you get groups of flowers that bloom at certain times and sequentially throughout the year. So this little guy does much more than its fair share of moving pollen, especially among tiny plants. Um, it might hit some of the larger ones, but also remember that an ecosystem doesn't just consist of our important food crops or the big showy plants we like in our gardens, but it also includes weeds that grow down low in the, the fields that we might not even notice. And those weeds are part of the biodiversity that is the basis for the whole food chain. So we want a very diverse vegetation that then supports a very diverse animal community above it. So here's an example of one of our very well-known flowers around here. It's a milkweed and it's called antelope horns. Um, people love this plant because it's one of the major um, hosts for the monarch butterflies. When they first come up from Mexico in the spring, 
they are looking for plants exactly like this to lay their eggs on. When it blooms, it attracts all manner of insects. And so on this, in this, you're seeing a couple of beetles. Um, this is a moth, a butterfly, and this happens to be another moth. Well, antelope horns, none of these are, are, are going to pollinate it. Partly because that's a pollinia, which is a pollen sac. And that has to be pulled from the flower and it has to be placed into one of these other slots on another flower. Well, in this case, this little moth isn't strong enough to pull it loose. It did get stuck on it and it's stuck there permanently. So this is kind of a dead end for the moth and it'll just die there. Um, a lot of insects are too small to pollinate the milkweeds. But we have insects that are larger and a carpenter bee really fits the bill. This is a fair, this is one of our biggest bees. And these are the pollinia that it has pulled out of all these little slots. And this is even on its butt hairs, it gets them. <laughs> so it's got lots of pollinia. There's a good chance one of those, as it feeds on the flower and moves on it, one will get stuck into these other slots. And that's how the milkweed gets pollinated. If it doesn't get a pollinate, if it doesn't get a pollinia stuck into it, there's no pollen inserted. It won't, um, it won't produce one of those big pods. So it just needs one of those to get a pod going. And then you have a lot of seeds. So when you see insects and flowers, they're not necessarily pollinating. They could be. And this is kind of a place that is not studied real well, partly because it requires looking at it in the field. Um, it, it's kind of hard to figure out experiments you can do in a laboratory that would mimic what happens in the wild in this case. So on one side, we have a lot of little beetles that are in a senna. And they're definitely messing around right in the main part of the flower, but they're not able to pollinate really because first of all, the pollen and bees are in tubes. The pollen is on the inside of the tube, not on the outside. So these are not picking up a lot of pollen on their body as they're feeding. Um, also, these beetles are not very mobile. They tend to get in one place and stay there. So that's not too helpful. However, this beetle is on a flower where the pollen is out on little tufts. It is so much there, you could take a paintbrush and just rub it and put it on other flowers and you could spread the pollen yourself. And that's exactly what this beetle is doing. It flies around quite a bit. It's moving a lot of pollen. So is this a good pollinator? It's mobile, it can jump from one flower to another. However, it's basically eating the flower and it's eating the ovaries, which would be where the seeds would be made. So no, it's not a good pollinator because the trade-off is a little too steep for the flower. So our main, the best pollinator we have and the most important in the insects, of course, are bees. And we have five major families of bees in the Austin area. Um, they've all, all bee families evolved from one family of wasps, the Crebronidae. And these are representatives of the five. Um, they all look fairly similar because they're all doing pretty much the same thing. Wasp babies need meat to develop. So the grubs of wasps feed on insects and spiders mainly. But bees evolved for their babies to feed on pollen. They became vegetarian. And so that means the bees purposefully gather the pollen to feed their young. And they've even developed specialized structures on their legs and body to, to do this. A corbicula is this groove in the side of a leg. You'll see this on honeybees and on bumblebees. And the, the pollen glob is stuck on like that and it's held in place by these hairs. The other, a lot of other bees have scopa, which are specialized hairs they have on parts of their body, whether it's their legs or their belly. And the hairs are kind of brush-like, so the pollen sticks to them very well. It also has a bit of an electrical charge that helps it cling, so it's kind of like static electricity helping the pollen stay on. Besides, the pollen is also sticky. There are a lot of ways that pollen is going to grip its travel companion. <laughs> and our bees range, our native bees range from really tiny, the smallest is about three millimeters long, to fairly good size, like a carpenter bee. 
So bumblebees are one of the few social native bees. Um, and you can see the pollen glob there. You can see how the others carry the pollen. Um, all the leafcutter bees have it on their belly like that. And some of the very tiniest ones will, you know, just they can re they go to one anther and kind of collect the pollen right off of it. This is a tiny bee about four millimeters long. And the colors of pollen are quite interesting. You can almost, if you know your pollens well enough, you could tell what these bees have been gathering on. The European honeybee is, of course, our most common bee in this area. It, sir, it has fit in right with the, and it competes with the native bees, but they still survive. It's not, it hasn't completely wiped out all other bees. Um, the different colors of pollen are generally caused by chemicals in the pollen that help protect it from UV light. Um, pollen is really sexual cells and the cells can be destroyed fairly easily if they're subjected to ultraviolet light. Sometimes you'll see bees, especially honeybees, collecting pollen, even on flowers that don't offer any, any nectar at all. And there, things like ragweed, or you'll see an oak that's in bloom, and they're, it's buzzing with bees. Elms have it sometimes. Um, these bees are simply after the pollen, and they're not, they don't understand that they're supposed to get nectar and the pollen comes with it, but they're just simply collecting pollen for their colony. There's another kind of pollination. Remember I mentioned about the tubes where the pollen's on the inside. That's not only the case of some sennas, but also solanums, um, things like nightshade and potatoes and tomatoes have this. And so in order to get the pollen out, this bee is doing buzz pollination. It's also called sonication. It vibrates its muscles, the same muscles that would make it fly, but without moving its wings and it vibrates it to make the pollen shoot out the side. So this one is catching the pollen on its leg. And so these little green bees do it. Um, bumblebees can do this. Uh, this is why they're used commercially to uh, pollinate inside uh, greenhouse tomato areas they, because they don't have natural pollinators there and it tends to help the plants produce more. So um, honeybees cannot do buzz pollination. They, they just ignore these kind of plants. <laughs> we also have a, another group of bees, about a little over 20% of our bee species, are not particularly common, but they are cuckoo bees. They don't collect any pollen. They lay their eggs in the other bees' nests. And so the other bees do the work of collecting the food for their babies, whereas these then just lay their eggs in the nest and take advantage of it. So they look very wasp-like. Um, because they don't have so much hair. One thing you might see that happens pretty often around here um, is nectar stealing. And this is when the bees are more interested in feeding themselves than they are in collecting pollen. And so the bees down in this area are all carpenter bees. They have very strong jaws, but they have a fairly short tongue. And so they have a hard time reaching in through the flower the normal way. So they just cut into the base to get straight at the nectar. And other bees will do the same thing. This one, though, is using its tongue to get in to the base. And even honeybees will do this sometimes. So it's kind of an interesting twist on it. And there's one other way bees can move pollen to their nest. And the masked bee does this. This is a very tiny bee. It also looks sort of wasp-like because it doesn't have much hair. It actually swallows the pollen and then it put, it stores it in a crop. If this sounds like birds, yeah, it's very much the same thing. When it gets back to the nest, it regurgitates it and that's how it's, it travels to the nest. Um, the pollen wasp does the exact same thing. And this insect is not at all related to either the wasp that developed into bees or the bees themselves. It's just another case of the same thing happening. It actually carries the pollen in a crop. And it's one of the very few wasps that has vegetarian babies. So that kind of brings us to the rest of the Hymenoptera, the, the wasps. Um, they are much more diverse than bees. With only five families of bees, we have at least 60 families or so of wasps probably in this area. 
um, they're very diverse from so tiny, they're microscopic up to pretty darn big ones. Wasps never collect the pollen for their babies, except for that one that I just mentioned, but the others don't. Um, these wasps are all just feeding. So adult wasps don't want to eat anything except sweet stuff. This is why when you've got a can of soda pop and yellow jackets like to come around it, they're after the sweetness. Um, so these wasps are all simply feeding on the nectar. So this is kind of the classic, okay, the flowers offering nectar. And in return, these messy little insects pick up pollen on their faces. And they're going to transport that pollen to other flowers. So wasps do a good amount of pollination too, just by their sheer diversity in numbers. They also contribute a lot to the protection of pollinators. <laughs> in, just because a lot of pollination goes on during the day, in broad daylight, when predators such as birds can see everything that's going on and if they see something tasty, they're gonna grab it. Um, Aposematic coloring are, are generally orange, black, yellow, white, red um, colors that are saying, they're warning colors to predators saying, don't bother eating me. I either taste bad or I can hurt you or you know something like that. So some of these insects do have bad tastes. Spider wasps, they certainly have venom and they can deliver it and the venom tastes bad. Um, net wing beetles have poisons within their body. The yellow and black lichen moth probably doesn't have much in the way of poison, but it has the same color, so it gains some protection from that way. So one thing you'll start to see a lot of when you start really paying attention to what's on the flowers are the mimicry. The mimicry is rampant in um, pollinators, especially among the flies. And so we're moving into now the second most important group of insect pollinators, at least in my opinion, are flies. Um, they tend to fly at lower temperatures than bees can. They're more diverse and there's just a lot of them. And they sometimes there'll be more flies than bees at flowers, but you'll sometimes see both. So all of these are mimics of wasps and they're pretty darn good mimics. They look very much like it. Wasps, when they go from one flower to another, they actually walk as much as they can. They don't like to waste energy flying. They'll they'll step. And so these flies that are mimics will they act like wasps too. One large group of flies are called cirphid flies. They're also called hover flies or flower flies. And a lot of these are bee mimics. Um, and they tend to fly more often. They don't they don't do the walking around so much, but they fly a lot. And you can see how bumblebee looking or bee colors. <laughs> so there's a lot of mimicry that goes on. And this is a very diverse and big group. Bee flies are another um, a family of flies. And you think, oh, they're probably called bee flies because they look something like bees. Well, some of them do like bees. Um, but they also, they're parasitic. Um, their larvae feed on the larvae of bees and wasps. So it's not really like this is a good insect, this is a bad one. These one, these actually will prey on other pollinators, but they also pollinate. So it's just a mix of things. The bee flies are quite diverse and they include some really tiny ones, all of which have these little proboscises that when people see them, they think, oh, mosquito is gonna bite me. But the proboscis is only used for um, sucking nectar, <laughs> basically. And the bee flies include some of like the ugliest flies I've ever seen. This is the weirdest looking one, and it really looks like this all the time. Another family is, are the soldier flies. And most everybody has at some time seen these beautiful green and black flies and think, what kind of bee is that? And if you look it up in bees, you'll just never find it. Um, they're very good mimics at times. And so they're another pollinating insect, especially in the spring and early summer, you see a lot of them. Another huge family of flies are the tachinids. These are known as parasitic flies. A lot of other flies are parasitic too, but these, their whole life cycle involves 
laying eggs on another insect or a spider and the eggs hatching and the baby flies feeding on the inside of that insect. Well, in this case, it's a caterpillar. And so these are a natural pest control. They're also pretty good pollinators because they do spend a lot of time feeding at flowers. And just a variety of little flies, everything down to this tiny little, it's kind of sometimes called a grass fly. Um, they're a little over a millimeter long. So really tiny up to medium size. And you can see how some of them even have the kinds of hairs on them that you think, oh my gosh, it's made to carry pollen. And flies that you don't associate with pollination, like house flies and blow flies, um, they do, the adults will feed at flowers. And because they're kind of messy, like you don't want a fly walking around on your picnic food uh, because they pick up stuff and they track it all over. Well, that's great for pollination. They're actually moving the pollen just like that. Love bugs are a kind of fly. And when they're active, the females especially will feed. So that's the female and that's the male. And he's just kind of hanging on while she continues to feed. And they're both just dragging through the pollen. Mosquitoes. When you think of flies, it's like, you know, you often don't think of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes feed on nectar and only the female needs to get a blood meal usually just once to develop her eggs. So the males, and this is a male with all that fuzzy stuff, uh, they feed just on nectar and the females will feed on nectar as well. So when it comes to flowers that are actually specialized to use flies as their pollinators, we do have a couple. And the Aristolochia, the pipe vines, are a classic example. Um, one, our most common one is the swan flower. It looks like grass from the, when you notice it. It's really hard to identify. But if you ever see caterpillars like this on a grassy hillside, this is the pipe vine swallowtail. And those caterpillars know what their host food is. So that is on a, even if it might look like a grass, it is a pipe vine. Um, pipe vine flowers don't smell real nice. They're down low to the ground. They have odd shaped openings and a lot of hairs. So the flies are lured in, they go all the way down into there. The hairs only point one way. And so this is called a pollen trap. And so once the flies are down there, they're stuck. The hairs won't let them back out until they've been in there a certain period and then the hairs wilt and then the fly can leave. By then it is wallowed in pollen and it's ready to go off to the next flower. And flies don't learn their lesson. It will go into the next flower too. <laughs> Okay, that takes care of two of the big groups of insects. The third is the moths and butterflies. And if you're observant about this, you notice that this sphinx moth is doing exactly the same thing that a hummingbird would do when it comes to pollination. Only in this case, instead of a beak, it's got a long proboscis and it gets the pollen all over its face as it's feeding. And it's about the same size as a hummingbird too. And they're sometimes they're called hummingbird moths. <laughs> and most of the moths aren't going to be active you know, during the day so much just because they're vulnerable to predation. But this is another sphinx moth that is active all day and it mimics a giant bumblebee really well. It even kind of buzzes the same way. Most daytime flying moths are either aposematically colored, meaning they have warning colors, or they've got disruptive patterns that make them hard to see on a, on a plant, or they actually mimic more dangerous things. Like if that looks like a wasp, that was, they, yes, it looks like a wasp. It's actually just a moth. And some of them are some of the best wasp mimics around. They've taken it to a new height. Um, the Texas wasp moth even has these large flanges on the back of its leg like wasps tend to have when they fly. <laughs> okay, but most moths are nocturnal. They don't have uh, different colorings. They're kind of bland and brown. Um, however, when in late in the season, like about now, when it starts getting too cold at night for even moths to fly, 
And moths are hairier than butterflies, so they're used to flying in the dark. Um, but it becomes impossible. They start flying earlier in the day. And it's, I've watched this, especially on large stands of flowers where you'll have moths buzzing around. If a warbler or a wren comes by and sees them, they, they just pick them all off. So the moths are just doing a last ditch effort to stay alive a little longer, but it's not very effective. And as I said, most moths pollinate at night. And the first time I really realized this was when I started noticing that crab spiders in the early morning are often feasting on nocturnal moths. <laughs> and crab spiders hunt without, they don't use their vision, they um, just feel for when the prey comes near. So they're hunting all night and that's what they're catching. So what about butterflies? Everybody loves butterflies. That's our, you know, they're the, the fun part of the Lepidoptera and they are active during the day. And sure enough, there are plenty of butterflies. They will visit any good nectar source and they'll move pollen around. So when you look close, you can see it on their legs and face. That's all they have to be doing to be pollinators. An interesting thing too is that this one is actually doing the same kind of pollination that the hummingbird and the sphinx moth can do, only it's using different body parts. The head is not the place that's touching the anthers, the top of the wing is. So as it reaches in, that's kind of the equivalent of the forehead of a hummingbird. <laughs> okay, then we have the beetles. That's our fourth big group of insects. Beetles were probably the first pollinators in evolutionary terms. Um, and nectar was not the reward they got. It was probably heat. Uh, the best example of this is still around up, up north. If you've ever seen skunk cabbage, which blooms in the spring, usually when there's still snow on the ground, but it melts the snow around it. The flower itself produces heat. And by having that little warm area, it would give insects a chance to get their life cycle started sooner for the short summer season. So northern climates would see this more. We don't see it down here because we just don't have hard winters and they're getting more mild as we go. Um, but we still have a lot of different kinds of beetles. It, it is the most diverse and the largest order of insects with the most species. And so this is just a small sampling of the kind of beetles you'll see that feed on pollen or nectar. This is a very common one that's seen, um, the bupestrids or the metallic wood borers. <laughs> their, their larvae feed on wood, but the adults are kind of bullet shaped and they often look sort of bee-like when they fly. Another kind of beetle you'll find in flowers, especially late summer, are blister beetles. And they have modified mouth parts that can go, they can be pushed together to form a little tube. So these beetles, which normally just have a chewing mouth part, like a biting mandibles, they can actually suck nectar just like a butterfly can. They're also in the flowers for a more insidious reason though. They lay their eggs in the flowers. And when they hatch, the baby beetles hook onto bees and are carried back to their nest where they feed on the bee larvae. There's a group of longhorn beetles. This is a large family, and these are called flower longhorns. They often look like wasps <laughs> with the same kind of color patterns, kind of pretty. They're very active. Beetles are not the greatest at agility flying, but these are pretty darn good at it. And this is a very interesting relationship that I have found over the years. One plant, it's called red root. And it only blooms once a year for a very short time, but it tends to attract our tiniest longhorn beetles more than any other plant I've seen. And a few other beetles too, but mainly these little longhorns. So I don't know why that happens, but it's interesting. And some of the flower longhorns are pretty spectacular. These are large insects and it's really fun to find them because they're gorgeous. So beetles, as you would imagine from a diverse group, of course, there's lots of different kinds that are feeding at flowers. Some of them carry the pollen, some don't. It just varies that much. Scarabs are mostly known as, you know, dung beetles or the June beetles you see 
However, there, uh, there is a subfamily called flower scarabs, and they're pretty good pollinators. Um, they often are attracted to flowers that have a lot of pollen, a lot of anthers, like um, prickly poppy, or the mallows, or, um, the primrose, which has sticky pollen that hangs together in strands. It's almost as if it was made to be taken up on these harder shelled insects and, and carried around. And some flowers, like a prickly pear, has a cup shape to it. And so it helps hold the beetles in place. And these beetles are kind of clumsy, like they can fall out <laughs> real easy. They wallow around in the pollen. They damage the flower quite a bit. However, prickly pears and a lot of the other flowers that they tend to visit have ovaries that are quite deep below the flower. So no matter how much damage the beetles are doing, they're not really hurting the flower's purpose. Okay, there was one more family and that's the true bugs. And I left that to last because they are just not that important when it comes to pollination. <laughs> You'll sometimes see bugs on plants and flowers and they feed on the nectar. Definitely they do that. Um, and they carry pollen around a little bit, but they're just not numerous and they're not one of the major players in this. They are, however, a good segue into predation. So we know that birds are predators that will see insects that go to flowers, but it's, I'm going to cover it at the more lower level down on the flowers themselves. These are both predators. Um, the predatory stink bug actually feeds more on caterpillars than anything else but they will feed on nectar as well. And the, the assassin bug though, is more likely to catch pollinators. And they do that by just staking out a flower and waiting and because sooner or later, something's going to fly in. And they sit like that and you think, how can they catch it? Because they don't have hooks on their, the ends of their legs, um, but their legs have sticky hairs and they work just like flypaper. And so that's how this caught what it what was flying in. There's another kind of assassin bug that's even weirder. It's the ambush bugs. Now, I know when most people look at this, they don't know what they're seeing because <laughs> it doesn't look much like an insect. There's the eye and the head, and the proboscis is back. That's its antenna. Its four legs are kind of raptorial, which means like a praying mantis's. And so the, the shape of the insect is such that it doesn't have to do anything other than just sit still and it, you can't even see it much. <laughs> but they're very good predators and they can take down insects quite a bit bigger than themselves. Like in this case, that is this, the ambush bug. That's its head. It has its proboscis right into the butterfly's face. And so that proboscis not only sucks liquid, it can also eject venom and that's how they catch their prey. So this assassin is even called the bee assassin. And I've often wondered like what they fed on before honeybees arrived on this continent. <laughs> and I suppose it was native bees, you know, the same size, but now I almost always see them eating honeybees. Um, and they just sit and wait and catch. I mean, they're definitely very good at this. I see them pretty often. Another predator that shows up on flowers, not as often as you think, are spiders. Um, one of the reasons that spiders aren't just all over the flowers waiting for their prey is that it's also a dangerous place because spiders can be the prey, especially of wasps. And so in this case, though, the bold jumper is aptly named because this little jumping spider will jump on your camera lens if it thinks you're getting too close. Um, I've watched, I've watched them hunt a lot. This one was after everything that came by. I didn't stay long enough to actually see it make a kill. <laughs> but there's another kind of spider that does sit in the flowers and is very good at catching. And I mentioned it earlier, the crab spiders. These are also sometimes called flower spiders. It tells you how much they spend their time in flowers. And they, they wait there for pollinators. And so they're not stopped by any kind of, um, Things like the distraction on the back of a hair streak will completely fool a jumping spider. And so jumping spiders almost never catch hair streaks. But the crab spider doesn't hunt by sight. It just feels. And so it grabs when it feels something close. 
So as you can see, there's quite a number of different sized prey they can take down. A lot of pollinators get it. This is a large spider that is, right now there are a lot of them out. They're mostly almost done with their life cycle, but once they're big, a carpenter bee is a large bee. So you can see how large these are when they hover near the, they stay near the flowers and just grab. But as you know, most, their spider webs are one of the best kinds of tools that any insect ha or any animal has to catch something. And the, the aerial web was designed to catch flying insects. So obviously, pollinators, their whole thing is flying, so they're going to get caught fairly often. One more predator that some people don't know about, and these are robber flies. Yeah, the name robber is because they catch things <laughs> and they, they sit and wait and hunt. They will only fly after moving targets. So they only go after things that are flying. Once something stops moving, they seem to lose track of it. So I've actually seen bees take evasive action. If a robber fly is after them and misses on the first try, the bee will drop to the ground and then fly low and the robber fly loses it. So just an idea of size, that's a honeybee, and this is a bumblebee. This is one of the more colorfully named robber flies. And yes, they always hold themselves by one or two legs as they're feeding. But that same proboscis that feeds on the insect can also take nectar. Another predator we know is good for your garden, mantises. They even sell mantis egg cases um, for garden things. Mantises are general predators and they often do ambush things that fly in. So besides predators, there are just a few other things that pollinators really have a problem with. And one of them is the weather. Uh, cold, wet weather will just stop an insect cold basically. So in this case, this bee can't move. If it, if it were cold enough that it would freeze, it would just die. So when the weather is very cold for long periods, there's not a lot of pollination that can go on because flight is limited. These animals are solar powered. Um, however, they're also the other end of the spectrum can be a problem when it's very hot and dry. Because insects, when they're breathing, they lose a lot of moisture with the with breathing and so if it's dry they're constantly having to renew their source of moisture if it's too hot they can actually overheat and cook and so when because flight muscles produce heat as they're flying so you know when it's when we have day after day of 100 degrees that's going to reduce the effectiveness of pollination too and of course habitat destruction i probably don't need to tell any of you about that that's definitely a major issue on all levels, um, from big wide scale removal of all plants to just taking out most plants so that there's nothing but a lawn. I happen to take that picture over my, our privacy fence in my neighbor's yard because <laughs> our neighbors don't like the fact that our yard has got lots and lots of plants in it. And so I think they're kind of a backlash. They took out all the plants in theirs. <laughs> and one thing that it doesn't seem as obvious, um, but cultivars, exotic plants in the wrong place, and the hybrids that are sold, these are all plants that have been developed by human intervention. You know, we, we've decided what we like and what it should look like, and the ins they don't need insect pollinators. We took care of that. And so a lot of these plants will have nothing to offer an insect. Um, this was at Zilker Gardens quite a long time ago. They planted a bed of tulips, <laughs> which of course lasted for one season. It was interesting, but it was eerily quiet because not many things could feed on these plants. Not There were no pollinators around them. So they're interesting for one thing, but they're not part of the ecosystem. Um, this often happens at large gardens up north where a short growing season, they'll put out beds of exotic plants just to look nice, and there'll be no sounds, no pollinating insects because it's 
there's just nothing for them. It's like a desert. Even though we don't see that, we see plants. And of course, the number one thing is indiscriminate use of pesticides. Um, if it's meant to kill one kind of insect, you know, things that kill caterpillars or aphids will kill bees and butterflies too. And it's so it's highly recommended that you don't use pesticides as much as, you know, like at all. <laughs> Not to mention that they are poison for us, too. There's very few pesticides that are safe for humans. Even organic pesticides that are meant to kill insects will kill insects. And pollinators are so mixed in with all the other insects that it's, you know, that it's very hard to separate them out. So that's your lesson on what not to do. Don't use pesticides, folks. <laughs> okay, so that's it. We'll open it up to questions. And I'll go ahead and stop the share. And sure. there we go. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was um, awesome. Um, I have a question. You you just mentioned and alluded to your yard and um, not using pesticides and things. If there was one piece of advice you were going to give to somebody who's interested in increasing the diversity of pollinators that they're able to bring in their yard, probably because they want to increase birds in their yard. What would you tell them to do? Where would you tell them to start? Okay, number one thing is diversify your plantings. To have as many kinds of native plants as you can. That um, Because pollination, it's not a one-time thing. It's something that goes on through the year. And we have a succession of things. I let our yard go kind of wild. And so we have a mix of natives and non-natives, but um, the vast, the largest stands of things are natives that have just come in. <laughs> they, they get bird planted or they flow in. I also, whenever I get the chance, I'll collect seed and throw it out in our yard. Um, you know, I recommend if you ever get the chance to participate in a plant rescue where they're gonna be clearing an area for, like along roads, pick up plants there. And just stick them in your yard. And, and, you know, the more stuff you can put in, the more diversified. And eventually, you know, some things take, some don't. Our yards become very shady. <laughs> we have a lot of trees in our yard. And, you know, I like that. But, of course, we don't have a lot of flowers all year. They tend to disappear a little bit. So yeah. go diversity first and, and try and stick with the good natives. Uh, for trees, the best things are oaks and hackberries and elms, you know, stuff that's really common around here. And for flowers, think about, okay, having your your spring blooms and your summer blooms and then things that will bloom in the fall. So like now things like frostweed is just finishing up. And in the spring, of course, there's plenty of flowers, but you know, just look for variety like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of diversity, it's clear that there are just, there's lots to know about it, the insect world. There's just so much there. If people are interested in learning more about insects, is there a place you tell people to start so that they don't get overwhelmed? And how, how do you tell, how do you start to learn the difference between a moth and a, a wasp and a moth that looks like a wasp, all those things. Oh, what, what advice would you give to people who want to know more, who want to learn more about insects? Okay, the first, the best thing is a field guide and the right. Kaufman series. Um, they have the Kaufman, the Insects of North America. It's for just a general beginner, it is still the best. Um, there was just, there is a new publication out called The Insects of Texas, and it's put out by Texas A&M. Um, John and Kendra Abbott from UT did that. It's a very good book, but it still doesn't give you the little overviews that are so helpful. I mean, that little Kaufman guide is the kind that you can just thumb through it and kind of get a feel for, okay, this is what these bugs look like and these. It, it's, it's small enough that you can thumb through and get a feel of it. And after that, then using bugguide.net is a really okay. useful place to go. Um, especially just if you want to identify something, they have an ID. Um, submission that you can do. Great. Great. 
Um, and finally, if if you were going to tell folks maybe your favorite places in the spring and in the fall to go look for pollinators, where where are some of your favorite spots to go to go look for them? Well, it's going to be places with flowers, you know. That's and I've been going out ever since the lockdown started. I mean, of course, I usually go to the Wildflower Center. I haven't been there since March because it's not exactly a low population area. There, there are a lot of people going there yet. Um, <laughs> I've been using the Mueller uh, Southwest Greenway mm -hmm. that's that in that lower corner. That's a really interesting place to go. Um, some of, and especially if you can go during the week, not on a weekend. But any of the city parks and just like we have the Dick Nichols Park near us. And for most of the year, it had huge stands of flowers. Anywhere in around drainage areas are good. Um, the, some of the, the metropolitan parks are real nice. And these are places you can go for free. You can stay so socially distanced. You might not see anybody while you're there. <laughs> And so they're, you know, within your neighborhood, I can walk a couple blocks and I'm, I'm at some greenways. The Violet Crown Trail goes through our neighborhood and along places in there. And you don't necessarily need a big area. It can be a, a vacant lot <laughs> will be interesting because when you're doing this kind of looking at the flowers, you're getting down really close and you, you won't notice that 20 feet away, there's a sidewalk. <laughs> right, right. Um, a question came in while we were just talking. Um, you mentioned insects and birds and you alluded to bats um, pollinating, but are there other mammals or reptiles that also are pollinators? There are other mammals, but not around here. Uh -huh. um, things like the possums in Australia, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, they, they have some, they're, they're usually tree climbers or, right. you know, um, and reptiles make really lousy pollinators because there's nothing in a flower that would lure them. They're uh -huh. cold blooded. They, you know, there's, there's just no, yeah, they're not really very They good. don't care about that. They're doing other things. Yeah. They want to eat the insects. That's the only thing they want to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's great. Well, this has been fabulous. There's lots of comments in the chat about how great your photos are, how you were able to present such detailed information extensively with people. Thank you. Bravo. We appreciate you. This is, this is excellent, Val. Um, but yeah, yeah I think I want to add to if anybody wants to email me, my email is on my website and anywhere else. If you've got questions, don't feel shy about emailing. I'm, I get them all the time. And Quite often, they're interesting to me. I it keeps me up on my IDs. Um, I Great. just I, I answer questions all the time. It's fun. Wonderful. Well, we'll include your contact information when we post the video. Um, okay, that'd be great. Well, thank you so much, and um, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, please be safe and enjoy the holidays, and we will see you in 2021. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Good night.